So welcome to you all. We normally start by telling people, take a couple of minutes to speak to the person who is seated near you. But I understand that you didn't need any prompt and that you did it spontaneously. So you will be and we will be able to start as uh, is tradition in all internet and jurisdiction, uh, event calls and so on at uh, the time plus four minutes. So with that, very happy to have you and I give the floor to Paul. Hello, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third global conference of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. My name is Paul Fellinger. I'm the Deputy Executive Director, and next to me is Bertrand de la Chapelle, the Executive Director. We will moderate um, on this first day and the third day the main sessions of the conference. Let me start by saying that we are extremely pleased to see so many stakeholders who have been actively engaged in the work of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network for such a long time now. And we would like to express an especial warm welcome to all the new stakeholders here in the room. This is the largest global conference of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network yet. You are almost 300 senior level stakeholders from more than 50 countries around the world. You are representatives from governments, from international organizations, the world's largest internet companies, from important technical operators and major civil society groups. How the policy network grows, how it matures and progresses is a true testimony to what we can achieve when we come together and collaborate. For the third time, such a uniquely diverse, critical mass of stakeholders gathers at the global level in the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. You all came here to Berlin because you care about the future of the cross-border Internet, because you strive to jointly develop the much-needed operational solutions and policy standards that are necessary to address some of the most pressing cross-border legal challenges of the digital 21st century. You are united here in the policy network today because you seek to reconcile the objectives of fighting abuses, protecting human rights, and enabling a global digital economy. And on this joint pathway, we now have, for the first time, concrete proposals for operational norms criteria and mechanisms on the table. These operational approaches are the result of intense work by over 140 stakeholders in the programs of the policy networks. They constitute a concrete implementation of the Ottawa Roadmap that came out of our second global conference in February 2018 that was hosted by Canada and in which many of you here in this room actively participated. I have one message for you. Let us make those three days count. Before I give the floor to our distinguished opening speakers, let me express a special thank you to the Federal Republic of Germany and the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy for hosting us here today in this remarkable historic uh, industrial landmark site, which is the gasometer in Berlin. Germany took the baton from Canada and France, our two partners of the previous global conferences. And I want to also express moreover our gratitude to the six international organizations that institutionally support this third global conference of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. The Council of Europe, the European Commission, ICANN, the OECD, the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, and UNESCO. Ladies and gentlemen, I was informed that unfortunately the Secretary of State, Christian Hirte, of our host, the German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy, is delayed and he's rushing to the venue. He will be with us shortly. I would very much like to give, therefore, the floor to actually the opening speaker of the second global conference of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, Associate Deputy Minister David McGovern of the Canadian Department of Innovation, Science and Economic Development 
Thank you very much for having been the host of the second global conference. Thank you to Canada for having been an active participant in all three programs of the Policy Network. And thank you for having been a member of the advisory group. You have the floor. Merci beaucoup. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here at Internet and Jurisdiction again after Ottawa last year and to be able to say a few supportive words at today's opening. First off, I want to thank you for organizing in Berlin this year. As you know, Ottawa is the world's coldest nation's uh, coldest capital city. And uh, who knew Berlin was a tropical city? So thank you very much. Uh, it, it's really wonderful setting to be discussing what comes next for the Internet and Jurisdiction Network. But first, I'd like to say a few words about the broader context. In order to emphasize why this conference matters, no less because it will pave the way for action over the next two years. I believe we need to acknowledge that in the face of concerns over harmful content and how data is accessed and used, governments are increasingly under pressure to act, but so are companies. And these problems are tremendously complex and require a thoughtful and balanced response. Some governments have already responded by putting in place new legislation or regulations for social media platforms, and many others are actively contemplating the same. And though such measures might be a necessary response, there's more to it. Governments need to keep working with companies and civil society as partners since regulation cannot solve every problem. In fact, there remains an integral role for multi-stakeholder efforts like internet and jurisdiction. We are only starting to get a clearer picture of what the real problems are versus what we perceive them to be. And in the same way, to fully understand the risks to the democratic, open, and vibrant societies that we want to be a part of. And there are so many different actors and technologies involved, all of them in continual motion. Data and research, like the Global Status Report, are crucial to informing effective decision making. Mapping global policy trends so that we can better understand their implications for the cross-border internet is needed. If we are to develop policies that preserve trust in a data-driven economy and that promote economic innovation, it's also important to understand differences in regional or local trends as well as emerging norms so that's something to bear in mind for future research. Finding ways to navigate this complexity is where internet and jurisdiction can play a key role. A prominent Canadian broadcaster said, to be complex does not mean to be fragmented. Now I'm pretty sure that she was talking about Canada, but the point is equally relevant here. This brings me to another comment I'd like to make. Inherent in accepting all this complexity and resisting the impulse to act too quickly is another notion, one of acting steadily across multiple fronts. This means not neglecting the practical or operational. In looking at what the Internet and JurisNet jurisdiction network has achieved since its earliest days, surely this is the result of taking a longer and more global perspective while coupling it with a dose of pragmatism. Imagine if we'd said back then, there's not much we can do because the task is too daunting. We wouldn't now have three sets of operational documents in the areas of data, content, and domains. It's worth highlighting that these concrete outcomes represent a promising level of multi-stakeholder consensus, a consensus that can and should be broadened 
to include countries not yet participating in the work. A popular Canadian Indigenous folk singer wrote that you should take your voice to where it will be most effective. Well, to be most effective, we need structures for cooperating. I believe we can be effective here, and regardless, we need to maintain the positive conversation so that ideas and solutions can continue to come forward and that they can continue and begin to be implemented. Like other countries, Canada is grappling with content and data issues, but we are also committed to building a digital economy that works. For example, Canada recently announced its digital charter, which reflects the priority that Canadians place in their data and privacy. This was developed by consulting widely with Canadians and it will guide further work in these critical areas. The Canadian government has also been engaged in a multi-stakeholder effort in the area of Internet of Things security. In partnership with the Internet Society, Canada's country code operator, CIRA, Canary, and a Canadian policy clinic called CIPIC. I'd also like to talk a bit about the Canadian government cross-departmental approach to internet and jurisdiction. We are fortunate to have had several key departments participating in the contact groups. And by drawing on a range of expertise, we have been able to contribute an array of useful inputs into the process. We have a working level group that allows for some light coordination internally and this has brought departments, my own Department of Innovation, Justice, Public Safety, Global Affairs, and Heritage, in contact in ways that are outside the usual formal policy-making process. This has enabled discussion and even the identification of some common concerns. Before closing and returning to the topic of our program for the next two days, I would like to touch briefly on the Internet Governance Forum. Canada has been a supporter of the IGF since its inception and we are also pleased to have provided a venue for Internet and jurisdiction to discuss and build its network. In closing, I'd like to turn to the Berlin program. We have solid outcomes from the contact groups. Facilitating the implementation of these outcomes seems like the logical next step. Also, coming to agreement on structures and approaches that will allow us to keep the conversation progressing should be a priority, while involving new actors and expanding the reach of the network. Lastly, I would like to offer my thanks to Internet and Jurisdiction, as well as the German organizers and other supporters and sponsors. I'm confident that we're moving in the right direction together. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks. And now it is a great pleasure to give the floor to our host, Secretary of State Christian Hirte. You have the floor. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted that the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network is holding its third global annual conference here at the Gasometer in Berlin-Schöneberg. This venue is part of Germany's industrial heritage. It was built in the early 20th century, from 1908 to 1910. This was a time when Germany and Berlin, in particular, were spearheading developments in science, research, and technology. A time when Berlin was a true hotspot, like Silicon Valley or Bangalore today. For eight decades, the gasometer played a fundamental role in Berlin's energy supply. Our economy and our prosperity used to be fueled by oil and, by oil and gas. Now, it is largely driven by data, bits and bytes. The Internet has become part of our critical infrastructure, which we need to protect and keep in good shape. This is important for many of us in our personal lives and most certainly for our economy. This is why we want to spend today and the coming days discussing the fundamental legal issues around the Internet. 
Mr. De La Chapelle, over the past few years, you and your team at the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network have demonstrated a great sense of focus on finding solutions to the most pressing legal questions arising in the context of the Internet. The Policy Network has also recently drawn up three working papers that will serve as a good basic for discussions. These papers explore the following issues. First, access to data stored on, served, on servers abroad. Second, how to treat domains that are used illegally. And third, how to treat illicit content. It would I would like to highlight and welcome the fact that the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network is based on a multi-stakeholder approach. Only if all stakeholders from the political arena, business, science and academia, civil society and the technical community work hard, hand in hand, will be able to overcome the legal challenges associated with the Internet. Germany and many other countries are advocating a truly global and secure Internet that can serve as a driver of innovation and social development, an Internet that is free from censorship, discrimination and propaganda. These are issues that play an immense role for companies as they decide where on the globe they want to invest. The global competition for FDI is no longer merely about tax rates or unit labor costs. Factors such as internet access, data usage and data security feature high on the list on, of priorities. This is one more reason why it is so important that the principles and underpinning the rule of law must continue to be enforced, also in the digital world. The internet cannot be a legal vacuum. Allow me to give a European example. A few days ago, on May 25th, the cele we celebrated the first anniversary of the European Data Protection Regulation, a legal text that ensures what is now a uniform and high standard of data protection across the EU. Data protection is now seen as a key ingredient for high quality digital services. And our companies have understood this. Those who treat data carelessly must fear for their reputation. There is a reason why Mark Zuckerberg called for new data protection requirements in the US and the whole world that should be based on the principles of the EU's General Data Protection Regulation. The next few days will be all about discussing, discussing solutions we can all agree to. Everybody needs to be on board, experts, and decision makers from all over the world and from all stakeholder groups. Only if the internet has procedures in place that are in line with the rule of law and ensure that customers' rights are enforceable will companies and their businesses' models have a secure future. The law enforcement authorities must know on what basis they can take action in the digital realm and in a way that is efficient and in line with the rule of law. By the same token, companies need legal certainty and clarity about what government authorities can and cannot do and about what contractual agreements are legal or illegal. The Internet certainly isn't new territory, at least not for most of us. But the work you are doing is close to being uncharted legal territory that has not been fully regulated yet. This pioneering spirit and creativity are what characterizes the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. I can only encourage you to stay curious and creative. If you do so, if, if you do that, I'm, if you do that, I am sure you will be more than successful. The outcomes of your work will later, be, will later be fed in the negotiations of the Internet Governance Forum that will take place here in Berlin from November 25th to November 29th. I trust that you and we all will gain many new insights at this conference. And I wish you a successful stay in Berlin, a city that has just become a global hotspot again, a a hundred years after its first heyday. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much also again for hosting on
in this very remarkable um, industrial landmark site. <clears throat> I would now like to give the floor to Ulrich Westergaard Knudsen, the Deputy, the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD, and I would like to thank the OECD again for its institutional support for this conference. You have the floor. Well, thank you so much, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I had actually been planning to start my intervention by praising wholeheartedly and at some length uh, the INJ, but uh, I'm a little bit afraid of the bell, so I'll, I'll spare it until the end, and then I hope you won't ring the bell on me. Um, otherwise, I'll also say merci beaucoup with our headquarters in, uh, in uh, France. It, it really is a pleasure to uh, be here at the third global conference of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. At the uh, OECD, we are very proud uh, uh, that we have this long-standing uh, collaboration uh, with the IG. So now I'll give it to you anyway in the beginning. And I'd like to extend a special thanks for inviting uh, us to speak here at this uh, timely and very uh, highly uh, relevant event. Every year it uh, becomes clearer that the Internet's uh, global interconnected and interoperable nature is creating powerful social and economic benefits on an international scale. The OECD has just completed uh, its first phase, or the first phase of its major project on digital transformation. We call it Going Digital, and it confirmed that data flows, including those across borders, are a critical enabler of economic and social activity. Today's trade and production activities are heavily dependent upon moving, storing, and using data across borders. For example, data flows enable the coordination of international production processes uh, through global value chains. They help small firms reach global markets, and they're certainly also crucial to delivering services. Data flows are also fueling uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, generating new business models and increasingly underpinning scientific endeavor. With more and more bo uh, mobile broadband subscriptions uh, than people in the OECD, it's clear that the smartphone in our pocket is also an integral part of our personal lives. Looking ahead, more data is now being produced every single day than during the period from the dawn of civilization to the early 2000s. I'll just, I'll just say that again. Every single day, even today, we produce more data than we did from the dawn of civilization until the early 2000s. That is really staggering. It amounts to about 1.25 billion DVDs full of data. By, 20, uh, by 2020, that's in, uh, by 2022, three times as many devices will be connected to the internet as there are people on the planet. So I don't think you can say that, uh, that IoT is coming. It's, it's really already here or certainly knocking uh, at, at our doorstep. Uh, as I mentioned, not all data travels uh, across borders, and we don't know exactly how much actually does. But by some estimates, those flows already contribute around 2.8 trillion US dollars to global economic activity annually. That equals about 3.5% of uh, global GDP. As the, as the volume of data grows, so do the stakes, of course. However, what is still underappreciated is that although the internet is borderless, laws are not borderless. All countries have laws that concern the internet. So asserting the authority of those laws, governments and private parties sent many demands and requests to internet businesses in other countries, asking them, for example, to remove online content, to seize domain names, or to provide information about users. These requests obviously vary in, in nature, and some recipients, uh, recipients might even just ignore them, whereas others may comply with every single one. But both of these extreme approaches, however, could tend to decrease the Internet's uh, openness. At one end of the spectrum, if a country's requests are constantly ignored, it may react by, en by enacting some sort of mandatory uh, data localization laws. But on the other hand, if recipients were to comply every single time there was a demand, there may be unwarranted takedowns, seizures, uh, data transfers, resulting in reduced access to information and less trust among users. So finding a way to, to streamline legal procedures across borders and make them easier and more efficient is a very pressing challenge and one that demands international cooperation. Your work here can help preserve the Internet's global character and avoid a value-destroying fragmentation into smaller mini-nets while at the same time ensuring that governments can achieve their public uh, policy objectives. And I would add that the structural shifts we see in the geopolitical world certainly add to the complexity of this. We are now talking about a digital iron curtain 
We are talking about a new technological cold war. Uh, the superpower rivalry in the trade arena has already moved to the tech arena with the controversy surrounding Huawei, the fight for uh, investment in artificial intelligence. This does not make this task easier, but it makes it perhaps the more necessary. Furthermore, we, we already see tendencies to this splinter net, as it's called. I'm pretty sure that if you went around the world and asked who owns the data that travel across borders, here in Europe, many people would say, well, the individual owns the data. In America, many would say, no, it's the market that owns the data, it's the big tech companies. If you ask in China, if you ask in Russia, you'll get a different answer. They'll say it's the state or the party, perhaps, that owns it. And if you ask in the developing countries, they say, yeah, we've heard about the data, but we don't really have any collection of it. Uh, so this is happening while we discuss these uh, issues, and it does certainly not make it easier. So we at the OCD, we welcome uh, your work, not only for what you're accomplishing, but also for how you're doing it. As a forum for international cooperation through soft law approaches, we at the OECD certainly appreciate the global and voluntary nature of the ANJ, uh, INJ initiative. And I can give you, just to finish, uh, a, a very uh, a recent in, uh, example of how this cooperation actually can bin, uh, bring tangible benefits. Only 10 years ago, we finished the, our, ministerial, our annual ministerial meeting at the OECD. Because of some of the geopolitical shifts I mentioned, we could not agree on trade, we could not agree on climate, but we did actually agree on a set of artificial intelligence recommendations. It's not hard law, it's soft law, but I think if we look back in 10 years, it'll be a major achievement of OECD ministers that we were actually able to agree on not only a set of principles, but also a set of policy uh, recommendations. And these are principles such as transparency, accountability, fairness, robustness, but also human-centered values. We hope that we can at some point perhaps even uh, uh, push this also at the G20 level. We already have 42 uh, countries signed up to it, uh, uh, so reaching uh, 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 beyond the OECD's uh, members. So I'll spend the last three or two or one second just saying that, that, the, that the, the digital transformation really has been at the center of what we've done at the OECD all year. We hosted a digital summit where it was the center of attention. The ministerial meeting I just mentioned had harnessing uh, the digital uh, as, uh, as its main uh, focus. So we stand uh, ready to help our members, but also to help the community here. We're proud of our cooperation and we hope it can continue in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for those words. I would, now like, <clears throat> I would now like to give the floor to Eva schulz kamm who is the Vice President of Global Governance Affairs of Siemens. Eva, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Excellencies, representatives, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, my deep thank to the organizer of this e event, the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, for inviting Siemens and to give introductory words. And you made it very clear in our pre-call that you would expect um, inspiration and, and um, also motivation for this outstanding conference. And you made also clear that the gathering here is truly about trust, improve the policy coherence and discuss concrete measures. So you expect a plan, right? After the conference for joint action. And this is really more than of essence because uh, we live in a world that is undergoing drastic changes and faster and faster so. Digitalization and globalization determine our actions today and at the same time they define the basic conditions, how we live, how we work, how we travel, how we communicate, how we do our business. But what is the link, the cement, the glue? What holds us together? It's about data. It's a carrier, you can say transmitter, some talk about currency, um, but what does it really mean for us? Let's think about that carefully. Um, as a global active company, uh, Siemens, and not many people know that we are one of the 10 largest software development for the industrial arena meanwhile, and we made uh, up our mind, and I want to bring some food for thought for all of you, what we believe is of the essence when talking about the governance um, of the Internet, and we talk about the Internet of Things, obviously. Let me ask three questions. Is a human being in the future just one machine among many in globally networked world? 
will all of us uh, in the society become nothing more than a smart factory um, where nothing counts but optimizing processes? What will happen to those who are not fast enough to adapt to the smart um, and fancy internet of things world? And this is the question Siemens is asking for because we don't not only do business but also we are thinking about business to society. So we have been discussing I think now more than one year um, about concrete principles that can help govern the smart data world. And I will present them. There are six principles. First, I think we, it's of, we believe it's of utmost importance um, to ensure people's autonomy. That means we need clear and purpose-driven rules for handling data. What happens to data, the how and why, must follow an unmistakable principle of dealing with our own and others' data transparently, responsibly, and with a careful focus on its purpose. Second, respect people and their work. This means defining access and usage of data clearly. Protecting fundamental rights and freedoms and, in particular, protecting intellectual property are at the heart of our, as we call it, Siemens Data Charter. People must have the choice and control of how their data is accessed and used in line with predefined transparent rules. Principle three is about keeping people secure. This means making cybersecurity a top priority. People will only support the digital transformation if they ha are convinced of the security of their data. That's why we need to create standards and the framework for a secure digital world. This is exactly what we have done with the Charter of Trust and you know that global initiative. Number four is about co-creation. This needs to get a priority. Co-creation is a success factor in a globally networked world. New ideas and solutions can only be developed in an open, goal-oriented dialogue as the one we're having today and in the coming days, and exchange of views among people and companies. That's why co-creation with people is the fuel of innovation. And we also like to use the word of sandbox, and we also need to have the regulator sitting next to me, for instance, happily sitting and working with that in that sandbox to find the right rules. Number five, we need to support societal benefits from data. This means we need to share data. We need to share selected sets of data for the common good. Societies are based on working coexisting among people. We therefore advocate for the secure and ethical or more responsible use of anonymized data in certain use cases that can benefit society as a whole without breaking partner trust or undermining intellectual property rights. Last but not least, number six, we need to create a sustainable benefit for people. This means letting data-driven products always deliver maximum value. Only those who act with foresight are flexible and adaptable. Data is only valuable if the respective infrastructure is up to date. You see, we think carefully about the challenges we are all confronted with, and our answer is clear. The real and woe, woe, woe of people and societies in the digitalized network world must not be decided upon by the survival of the fittest. And reason and forethought must pave the way for the future. In my last minute, I, I want basically to, to sum up and, and give some advice, if I may, to the conference. We are a large group of stakeholders from different fields, from different countries, um, from different origins with different interests. But my strong belief is really that we have to focus if we want to have an action plan and on a rule setting that we have maybe five, maximum ten of rules where we believe, strongly believe, this is at the essence, as of the heart of the data-driven world we want to live in, which is human-centric and really uh, provides broad value, not only for industries, but also for the citizens worldwide. So my pledge to all of you and to myself, obviously, is that we really try to find the essence in the next days and everyone become an ambassador of these principles and, and carry it on that we see a development and rules coming fast uh, for secure and trusted Internet of Things. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks. I would now like to give the floor to Moes Chakchuk, who's the Assistant Director General for Communications and Information at UNESCO. If we can please move the microphone to there. And um, I would like to thank UNESCO for the institutional support for this conference. And I would also like to thank Moes personally for being a member of the High Level Advisory Group. You have the floor. Thank you, Paul. I'm very pleased to be here for my second time since I'm in UNESCO. Last time was uh, after the wonderful conference on Freedom Online Conference in Berlin. And it is a great pleasure to be here again because I participated in the first meeting on the global uh, for internet and jurisdiction meeting. So distinguished delegates, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express my gratitude to the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network for inviting me to speak on behalf of UNESCO at this third global conference. As all of us gathered here now know, the internet and other related digital technologies have transformed our societies, bringing about uh, unprecedented opportunities for the sharing of information and knowledge. However, as we have seen in recent years, particular challenges have also emerged, such as infringements on privacy and the spread of content, inciting violence, hatred, and discrimination. In responding to these challenges, we must not lose sight of the original values and principles that have underpinned the Internet's development. In our work on Internet governance, UNESCO promotes the framework of Internet universality, which is defined by four principles summarized by the acronym ROAM, which stands for an Internet that is human rights based, open, accessible to all, and nurtured by multi stakeholder cooperation. A key value of this framework lies in its holistic approach. It's con it considers not only the protection of those rights, but also their impact on the broader dim dimension of preserving the internet openness, accessibility, and multi-stakeholderism. At UNESCO, we believe that many of the challenges raised by internet and jurisdiction in the field of cross-border regulation of the internet cannot be fully addressed without a framework based on internet universality and supported by multi-stakeholder participations at all events, at all levels. In order to operationalize the Rome principles and provide states and other stakeholders with an internationally recognized tool, UNESCO has developed Internet Universality Indicators. These indicators will serve as an important tool for the voluntary assessment of the state of Internet development at national level. As their use for national assessment is unfolding in several countries, UNESCO encourages support to the ongoing processes of national assessments using these indicators. As an increasing number of countries have just started conducting the Rome X indicators assessment, it is my strong hope that the results that emerge from these studies will help inform the operational norms, criteria, and mechanisms that the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network works to develop. As for the German IGF next November, we are looking forward to presenting preliminary outcomes of the underway assessments conducted in a number of countries by multi-stakeholder advisory committees that UNESCO supported to be set out for this purpose. UNESCO's Internet Universality Indicators are available, of course, online in different languages, and I would encourage all of you to consult them on our website. Ladies and gentlemen, UNESCO supports the mission of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network to preserve the cross-border nature of the Internet through fostering global multi-stakeholder dialogue. We have engaged with the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network since its very beginning, and it has been a pleasure to see the progress made and outcome achieved over the years. As Internet and Jurisdiction has recognized questions related to data, Content and domains have uh, posed challenges that risk challenging the cross-border nature of the internet. In addition uh, to the work of these themic, uh, thematic tracks, which we'll gather this week, we recognize the excellent resource provided by Internet and Jurisdictions Observatory through the policy development, judicial decisions, and international agreements documented in the retrospect database. Therefore, I'm confident that many opportunities to strengthen our collaboration lie ahead building on our joint reflection in the field of judiciary capacity building, for example. Uh, UNESCO has contributed to the strengthening of judiciary systems with more than 10,000 judges in Latin America and Africa, trained on standards related to freedom of expression, 
access to information, and the safety of journalists. Such activities provide an opportunity for us to foster the implementation of the internet and jurisdiction policy network outcomes as part of the UNESCO global framework on judiciary capacity building. The internet and jurisdiction policy network represent one crucial venue for global multi-stakeholder dialogue on the internet governance. We must also continue to engage in, our, in other multi-stakeholder dialogues, including internet governance fora at the national, regional, and international level. UNESCO was pleased to welcome the 2018 edition of the Global Internet Governance Forum, and we look forward to meeting many of you back here in Berlin in November uh, for this year's IGF. As we discuss the uh, jurisdictional problems of the internet, we must also look on at ongoing discussions of the governance and regulation of other emerging digital technologies, namely artificial intelligence. Here too, we believe that uh, the Rome framework may be useful lens for informing our collective work. Binding on our 25 years of experience on convening multi-stakeholder dialogue and developing recommendations on the ethics of science and technology, UNESCO is now considering developing a recommendation on the ethics of AI. In November, our 193 member states will make a decision in order to develop a non-binding international standard-setting global instrument, which would be a major achievement towards a human-centered artificial intelligence, building on the principles recently adopted by the OECD and engaging especially developing countries in the debate on the future of AI. Through the continued cooperation of all stakeholders, we can ensure that the universal internet that remains free and open and accessible to and governed by all, leaving no one behind. On behalf of UNESCO, thank you very much for your attention. I, will you, I, will, I wish you a, a fruitful discussion of this global conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for those words, Moz. Our next speaker is Catherine Maha, the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation. Unfortunately, she got sick and lost her voice. As you hear, I also have problems with my voice, so I can relate to this. But she nevertheless insisted yesterday that she absolutely wants to record a short message to address you, the stakeholders in this room, which we now like to play before then um, Jan Gerlach, um, the senior public policy manager and counsel of the Wikimedia Foundation, takes the floor and delivers her remarks. Can we play the video, please? Hello, my name is Catherine Marr, and I'm the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation, the nonprofit charitable organization that operates Wikipedia. I'm so sorry that I couldn't be there with you in Berlin today. I've been ill and unable to make the trip. However, I felt it was essential to speak to the importance of this summit and this moment. I'm speaking on behalf of tens of millions of Wikipedia's creators and curators from every continent and representing at least 300 languages. I'm also here on behalf of the roughly 1 billion people that access the Wikimedia projects every month, seeking knowledge and learning. Wikipedians document the shared knowledge of our humanity because we believe a world that is better informed is a world that is better equipped to rise to our common challenges. We stand for the public good and operate in service of a public trust. This conference represents a place for civil society, platforms, elected representatives, and policymakers, other stakeholders, to come together and discuss how we can safeguard our societies while also elevating our essential rights and freedoms. Over the next two days, we would do well to consider the promise of the internet to connect people and to serve the common good. As such, I urge you to consider the following the importance of clearly enumerating and articulating the norms and values upon which we agree and seek to elevate, the responsibility of governments to protect and platforms to respect human rights, the challenges and risk of reactionary responses and one-size-fits-all regulation, the need for cross-border collaboration in service of our common humanity, and, of course, the need to broadly engage all stakeholders, especially civil society, in these critical dialogues. Wikimedia's vision is a world in which every single human can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. We believe that this summit is an opportunity to think carefully and closely about how we build this shared future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, you have the floor. No, 
Yes, yeah. all right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jan Gerlach. I am a senior public policy manager at the Wikimedia Foundation. You have just heard from my boss, Catherine Marr. Today, I am here to tell you that we cannot achieve our vision just by ourselves. Laws and public policy must promote and preserve the freedom to share and participate in knowledge. We should recognize the dangers of a one-size-fits-all approach to regulation that applies equally to all forms of information and platforms. Consider the risks of creating a single policy around digital information enforced by an automated system. Complex nuances around language and culture, humor and intention will be put through an assembly line of machine analysis. To avoid increased enforcement and fines, internet platforms will almost certainly choose to remove more instead of less. This type of approach preferences platforms over people, places limits on knowledge and collaboration online, and effectively builds walls between people and ideas rather than bridges. The internet is a pathway to knowledge that shapes how we see the world by breaking down boundaries and connecting people around new ideas. Unlike other internet platforms, Wikipedia does not localize language for different countries, does not localize knowledge for different countries, or target it to individual users. Versions of Wikipedia are differentiated only by language, never by geography, demogra demographic, or personal preference. That means the information on Wikipedia is the same whether you are in Berlin or in Brasilia, and editors from around the world can work together to improve, correct, and advance knowledge. Such a flourishing and competition of ideas and perspectives from different cultures may be a messy process, but it allows people to build consensus on how we see and share the world around us. As such, knowledge and Wikipedia is richer, more useful, and more representative when more people can engage together. Yet many countries have differing regulations around what they consider to be acceptable online. This is why we are here today. Forcing platforms to comply with these competing regulations can eliminate crucial opportunities for collaboration. Instead of a universal internet where people can continue to collaborate together, this type of nation-based regulation and its enforcement outside a country's territory will reinforce borders and create islands of isolated information online. Any regulation also needs to consider its impact on international human rights. They are universal, fundamental, and they are non-negotiable. How can this group here to, today support and guide communities around the world to develop standards around high quality information while still safeguarding freedom of expression and non-discrimination? We should carefully examine all solutions to make sure that we are aware of how potential restrictions could be abused, applied unevenly to different populations, or enforced too broadly in a way that silences or excludes people online. When we are overzealous about limiting knowledge, we risk impacting inclusivity and diversity. Permanent removal of knowledge can have long-term invisible impacts. We also need to be honest with ourselves about what success actually looks like. Because the internet is a mirror of society itself, we will never achieve a perfect internet, one that has eliminated all harmful content and all bad actors, just as no combination of laws will ever eliminate crime. These are human behaviors, not diseases. They cannot be eradicated, only reduced. If there are disagreements around what is harmful, regulation should always default to keeping knowledge free and unfettered and the internet open. Wikimedia's recommendation to give is to give power not to the few, but to the many out there. Wikipedia is often held up as an exception to more traditional models for the consumer web, but we actually believe it is the example that decentralized models of curation and regulation can really work. Wikipedia has shown how effective it can be when we empower communities to uphold a clear mission, purpose, and set of standards. As we look to the future of content moderation, we must sim similarly devise means to involve broad groups of stakeholders in these discussions in order to create truly democratic, diverse, and sustainable online spaces. By meaningfully engaging more people and organizations today in the future, and in the future, we can develop standards and principles that are more inclusive, more enforceable, and more effective. And there goes the gong. Um, we should also expect and encourage constant refinement of these processes. 
to safeguard against exploitation by third parties from bad actors to biased institutions. And to close, I leave you with this. Facts are the currency of the digital ecosystem where we all live, work, create, and play. When we place limitations on the type of information we will allow online, we risk placing artificial boundaries around and within this ecosystem. We need to think carefully and closely about how any regulation will impact a flourishing and open internet that allows for new forms of culture, science, participation, participation and knowledge. Thank you, and I think I get the prize for two gongs. <laughs>
And I'm extremely happy to have seen them in action concretely during the work of the contact groups. And those of you who have been in the contact groups, please share with the other participants uh, how it was. There's a second dimension, which is the issues that we have to address require a systemic approach. And the values or the virtues that I mentioned before, they are the basis upon which we can build this methodology and the way to address what are actually problems of complex dynamic systems. Situations where a small action or a small event can trigger a cascade of consequences, both spatially and in time. And the governance of cyberspace or in cyberspace can only be built on an issue by issue basis with the different spaces allowing the stakeholders to develop solutions that can be implemented. And that means the traditional triptych it means communication so that people understand and all actors understand the environment, the concerns, the initiatives, and even the intentions of the other actors so that you avoid prisoner's dilemma situation, you reduce the potential for escalating conflicts and the legal arms race that is happening too often. The second element is beyond communication, there is a need for coordination. But Whenever you say coordination, usually the idea is that there's somebody above you that is coordinating you. This is not what it is about here. What it is about is the norms of behavior, the things that allow people to conduct their activity in an autonomous way, but still being knowledgeable and conscious about the impact on others. It can be the rules of behavior as simple as what is in traffic the rule that everybody drives on one side of the road. Once you've agreed on one of the sides, you can go and be autonomous. So coordination is a second element and cooperation that we highlight so much, so much so that it's on all of the things around this room, is when it is needed, when you need to or benefit to mutualize resources or efforts, or when you uh, need to create new structures or institutions or mechanisms to implement stuff or to enforce compliance in some cases. Those three elements are fundamentally what the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network has been fundamentally created to provide uh, this community. And I think the operational approaches that some of you have already kindly referred to demonstrate that this can work, that we are not in a collective delusional state that in a world where basically the word cooperation is almost a dirty word, the ones who actually believe in it can show the way and that they can move forward. And in finishing, I want to highlight on a larger scheme of things, where do we want collectively to go? Where can we go? Because this is going to be the key topic of those three days. If you look throughout history, Humanity has been confronted over and over again to the challenge of organizing itself in larger and larger communities. This is one such moment. We now are confronted with the challenge of organizing the coexistence of literally billions of connected people all around the world with vastly different philosophies, political framework, religious, etc. And this is nothing short of a civilizational challenge. What is the digital society we want to build is a question that we already raised in Ottawa and it's even more accurate or acute uh, today. Who and how are the norms going to be set, implemented and enforced? Full harmonization or uniformity is neither desirable nor probably achievable or vice versa, neither achievable and probably not desirable either. But at the same time, the alternative, which is the competition of all against all to impose one's own norms to the maximum extent, is only triggering additional conflicts and rewarding the, power, the most powerful. We can do better than this alternative. And here, this is the reason why interoperability, which has enabled the success of the internet and the World Wide Web itself 
is proposing potentially a more flexible and scalable approach and a more balanced one. Like the... I think there was something on the screen that was looking at a different part of me. Were I? Right? <laughs> so just to finish, just like the internet has basically allowed the interoperability of heterogeneous networks that can be developed on their own but still interoperate, our challenge is to develop the ways for the different governance frameworks, public and private, that exist around the world and that now interact to become able to coexist and to interoperate. And I think that reconciling in this way the need for global solutions with the autonomy of the different actors and the um, respect of their differences within general principles is the approach that we hope we will be able to explore together in the coming uh, two days. And this is an exciting ambition, reconciling, as Paul said, the objectives of fighting abuses, protecting human rights, and developing the digital economy is an exciting ambition. And I think that the people in this room are the ones, and in the network, are the ones best placed to do this. And I wanted to share that with you because it's fundamentally at the heart a human network first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Before now transitioning to the next session, I would just like to briefly give the floor to one discussant of the next stakeholder plenary on managing legal interdependence, who unfortunately has to go to the airport to catch a plane afterwards. Max Senges is Google's lead for internet governance, and Google was a member of all three programs, contact groups. Max, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Bertrand. Um, welcome especially to the new delegates and participants to the INJ community. It's good to see many of you again. Since the foundation of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network eight years ago, Google has strongly supported its mission, which I would paraphrase as reconciling the global nature of the Internet with the local nature of law. Via the method of multi-stakeholder -stake deliberation and cooperative solution development. In our view, it's absolutely crucial to bring together stakeholders from every group involved on equal footing. This is something that very few organizations can and that uh, INJ certainly pioneers here to make a reality. To ensure the continued success of multi-stakeholder governance model for future generations and on a transnational level. Both aspects are important, that we get the future generations and that we have the transnational level. Deliberation, not negotiation, results in effective multi-stakeholder governance. And as Vin pointed out, allow me to note that the actual governing is often precisely not multi-stakeholder for good reasons. The deliberation should be but um, uh, with everybody together, but then different parties make different policies and de develop different solutions. And then other parties have the responsibility to follow and cooperate with those so solutions. That's the, the tricky part that is often misunderstood by uh, folks when they hear multi-stakeholder governance. Let me speak uh, for a couple of moments on the concrete outcomes that Google is looking for when we are here in the network. On content, as the platform, online platforms have become increasingly popular, there is a rich debate about the best legal framework for combating illegal content, but in a way that is, respects social values like freedom of expression, diversity, and innovation. INJ can help us think through our individual and shared responsibilities in a way that upholds these critical values. Again, something that is quite unique. On domains, continued work towards a shared understanding of principles for the name lane suspensions and improved use of common tools from for monitoring to reporting to response and le which leads to improved trust and registrants and users that appro um, appropriate actions are being taken by industry where registrars and, or registries are the appropriate parties to take action on online abuse. And lastly, on data. 
modernizing the approach to cross-border cross access to information and developing an international framework that allows countries to commit to baseline privacy, human rights, and due process principles to gather evidence more quickly and efficiently is key. Now, um, when it comes to expectations, they're high, Bertrand, Paul, for the whole team, for everybody here. I think these, these are very dare times, and we need to prove that this multi-stakeholder approach can actually work. In Vin's words, let's stop complaining and collaborate on solutions. And I think that could almost be the motto for INJ. Importantly, we have the United Nations Internet Governance Forum here this um, in about six months, and the IJ was born in that context and is continuously using it to report back and to um, some way formalize and integrate its results into that um, process. It's to co uh, that coordinated and effective transnational internet governance regime that we're looking forward to. Let me jump to the end. We are committed to continue our support to the INJ network, and we are happy to discuss and share our experiences as participants in the network with everybody interested in joining or thinking about how to get the most out of the network. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for those words. <clears throat> The issues we are addressing in those three days here have arrived at the top of the international agendas around the world. We all know that the devil lies in the details. How we operationally solve these cross-border legal challenges will define the future of the cross-border digital society and economy. The solutions adopted now will have a long-lasting impact. However, despite a great sense of urgency, we need to be aware of unintended consequences of our actions and the responsibility that lies upon us, upon our generation. I therefore second what Bertrand was saying. Communication, coordination, and cooperation are key and the defining drivers of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. I would like to briefly walk you through the program of the third global conference. In a few moments, we're going to introduce the world's first Internet and Jurisdiction Global Status Report. Right after that, the stakeholder plenary session will begin to discuss how to manage legal interdependence and establish the necessary interoperability across borders between public and private actors, but also between norms. This session will already be an opportunity to discuss the concrete proposals contained in the operational approaches documents that were released in April by the members of the three programs. And before the break starts, we will shoot a quick family picture of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network here in this room. The stakeholder plenary will then resume after the break. And the first day will culminate in a presentation by the Secretariat and the coordinators of each program of the proposals for norms, criteria and mechanisms contained in the operational approaches documents. In this session, the details for how the second day of the conference will be structured based on the workbook that you all received will also be explained. You find the operational approaches documents and the workbook in your delegate bag. And then tomorrow, the three meetings of the data and jurisdiction, the content and jurisdiction, and the domains and jurisdiction programs will run in parallel. Following the methodology adopted in Ottawa, stakeholders will discuss a Berlin roadmap for how we can collectively advance the development of operational solutions and policy standards and structure further work in the policy network. The third day will again be organized in the stakeholder plenary format here to present the results of the discussions of day two and then to discuss together the way forward.